<laughs> I appreciate that. Um, well, first of all, Mr. Chairman, uh, I'm new to the committee, uh, new to the complexity of this issue. I, I think we've been in enough hearings now, you realize that my thrust always ends up being, you know, the KISS principle, you know, keep it simple. Right. Um, and this is a classic example of it. Uh, we have so many different programs to try and alleviate poverty. And, you know, one of the charts I used in the earlier uh, hearing here is, you know, prior to the war on poverty, we, we had poverty rates dropping precipitously from about 22% down to about the 15% range. And in the 50, 60 years since the war on poverty, we've spent about $23 trillion. It's pretty well flatlined. It's gone up and down a little bit, but, you know, we, we haven't conquered. We haven't won that war on poverty. I would argue part of the problem is, is simply the complexity. I mean, you know, even this chart, I'm an accountant. I actually do understand numbers. It's like, I don't know how any working family or non-working family or any would even begin to comprehend what the incentives are. They'll just take what money they get. Um, I would argue we ought to really focus entirely on simplifying what it is we're trying to do. And of course, the, the real challenge in any type of, you know, we're a compassionate society. We want to help people that can't help themselves. We want to help people help themselves, right? The trick is how do you design benefit programs that don't make people dependent on government, that don't encourage people to, you know, we got what, 20% of the adult working age male population permanently out of the workforce? Um, that's, that's not good for America, that's not good for them, that's certainly not gonna solve poverty. So, you know, Ms. Rashidi, or Dr. Rashidi, you were talking about the different programs. How many different programs do we have trying to help people? I mean, do, do we even know the number? <laughs> Well, we have tried to quantify it. There's actually 80 plus programs that are means tested. Only 80? Um, yeah, 80 plus because it's a little bit hard to identify all of them. Um, but yes, but there are, there are roughly five or six major programs that kind of account for the major expenditures that cover food, housing, and, and basic necessities. Yeah, it's so difficult because it's, you know, just single mom with one child. Too. I mean, it's hard to come up with stock figures, but I, I don't know whether you're familiar with the work of uh, former Senator Phil Graham and John Early. You know, they look at the income gap or the wealth gap, which you know, on its surface looks pretty dramatic, but then when you, from the, inc the top earners, when you take away taxes, and from lower earners when you add benefits, all of a sudden doesn't look quite that bad. Uh, can you comment a little bit on that? Yes, that's very true, and, and actually the CBO puts out great data on after-tax and transfer income, and it shows very different trends than if you're looking at pre-tax. It shows not only that the gap you described shrinks, but it shows that income, considering all benefits and after-tax, has increased for those um, in the lowest uh, income quintiles. So it's important to look at that after-tax and transfer because this, uh, the federal government does provide a lot of tra transfer payments to low-income households. And again, these benefit programs are tax-free. I think we kind of lose that in the translation as well. Uh, in a budget hearing, this is many years ago, and when we were considering budget items as opposed to climate change most of the time, uh, I remember we had a, I think the, the individual was in charge of the welfare system in Pennsylvania. And what was striking about his testimony, and these are just gross numbers, don't hold me to them, but it, it, you know, he was describing a person in Pennsylvania who for every additional dollar of, of work, she would make more money up to about 30 some thousand dollars worth of income. And then she would have to make something like $65,000 before she'd, put an additional dollar in her pocket because of the drop in benefits versus, so again, what you, is that called the, the, the welfare gap or I mean, or the benefit? Benefit the, cliff. Benefit cliff, yeah. Um, that's a significant problem. And, and, and you talking about earned income tax credit versus this child tax credit, just the complexity of all this stuff. Uh, I would argue we really ought, as opposed to just focusing on child tax credit and all these studies that are, produce different results based on time frames. Again, your head just starts swimming the complexity. I don't think you can really draw any conclusions to it. I would argue what the Finance Committee, what this subcommittee ought to do is take a look at these benefit programs in total. What can we do to simplify them to accomplish the goal that we all agree on is how do we help people help themselves? How do we help people that can't help themselves? You know, how, how can we make sure that children uh, don't live in poverty? How, how can we actually, 
win the war on poverty, because we're not doing it. And we've spent trillions of dollars. And I would argue, you know, one of the problems, one of the biggest problems for people in poverty is that a dollar they held at the start of this administration is now worth less than 86 cents. And it's kind of hard to develop programs that make up for that damage, which is caused by massive deficit spending. And what are we massively deficit spending on? Programs that make no sense. That, again, there is no way a, a, a human being can understand exactly how they ought to maneuver to take best advantage of this. I mean, it's just, it's just impossible. So, I mean, I'm, I'm sorry, I appreciate all your, your scholarship here, but I mean, I just, I listen to these studies and my head just swims. Uh, Mr. Corinth, you want to, or Dr. Corinth, you want to comment on this at all? Sure, I, I would just note in terms of trends in poverty, you're exactly right. If you look at the official poverty measure, we've made no progress. That said, if you include all of the benefits that we pay out, we have made a lot of progress in reducing poverty over time. The only problem is that it's come through government transfers as opposed to self-sufficiency. And actually in the 90s when we had welfare reform, we not only saw poverty falling, we also saw uh, self-sufficiency growing. So we can do both. You can both increase work, increase self-sufficiency, and reduce poverty. You just need programs that encourage work, like the existing child tax credit and the EITC. So one of the results of what you just said there, what we ought to do is take a look at these, you know, how we calculate poverty, and we ought to build into that you know, the value of the benefits. Uh, so we're actually looking at because again, I, I, I think that's okay. I, and most Americans say, fine, great, if we've reduced poverty and these people are getting benefits, great. But I'll go back to my main point. How do you provide those types of benefits without encouraging dependency? And you know, what, what actually does long-term solve poverty, people work plus providing people the dignity of earning their own success as opposed to just being dependent on government. So anyway, I think it's, th these are extremely interesting hearings. I, I don't understand most of it. I don't think most people understand most of it, and I, I'd like to understand it. So I, that's what I would, you know, just yesterday in budget hearing, I said the same thing. We were talking about Social Security. I said, let's, let's have some round tables where, where we can have full discussions, where we're not talking about by each other and start fixing these well, problems because yeah. we're not fixing them. Yeah, and I'll take that as a start. I mean, at least this isn't a boring hearing. Most of the hearings around here are pretty boring. So <laughs> thank you for that. And I would say just a little bit of a reaction to what you're saying. You know, one place I think where it's pretty, pretty clear that we've done a good job on poverty, not as good as I would want, but a good job on poverty is Social Security, you know, and what the poverty rate for seniors would look like if we didn't have that program in place. You know, that's something that actually has worked, and I think that was very much on my mind when we were crafting the child tax credit. Simplicity, that was very much on my mind when we were crafting the child tax credit, because unlike a billion other programs that this committee or this Congress writes in its wisdom to, to try to make America's life better, you know, what we said is let parents make the decision about how to spend this money. So the, the, problem, the, the problem with Social Security is it was a concept that made sense, but when we extracted those payments out of people's wages, we didn't put that money into account for them. We spent it. The money's gone. Yeah. Had we actually put that into, like, real assets, we literally, I've done the spreadsheet on this, we'd literally have yeah. $6 trillion of hard assets that the Social Security Administration could call on as opposed to, you know, those government bonds that have no value to a government agency. Right. You've got to, ref you've got to you know, borrow more money for that. So, but, but that's, we, that, we, we couldn't even get that out yesterday in that budget hearing. So, again, what I'm encouraging is... That's another... Th th these are, this, this kind of dialogue yeah. in a kind of round table as yeah. opposed to standard hearing where we get yeah. five minutes worth of questioning, right. where we can really vet these issues, then rely on experts to tell us right. when we're either full of it or, no, that's, right. that's about right. So right. We, we need to have, yeah. and I think in a public setting too, not just in closed doors, but we need a public setting where we have these discussions and both sides get to talk with each other as opposed to past each other. And I think that's great. And you know, you, you, know, you, you mentioned something that I think is, is really important as well, which is the persistent chronic you know, rate of uh, numbers of people 
you know, in America who are not today working. You know, the system that we have is a system, it, it, you know, the system we have, not the system with the child tax rate, the system that we have, you know, our workforce participation rate is actually lower in America today than it is in every single one of these countries that has a child allowance you know, where people have the opportunity to be able to get a little bit of an incremental bump to their income to, 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 to stay at work, to pay for a little extra child care, to pay for, you know, for a little bit of extra after school program. I've met kids in, or te parents in Colorado Springs who were telling me about how their, ability, their expanded child tax credit had enabled them to pay for a bicycle so that their kid could stay at an after school program in the spring so they could stay at work. And if they didn't, if they had to go pick that kid up, and that for me, the thing about this, I think, Senator Johnson, is that, you know, having been the superintendent of the Denver Public Schools, a school district where most of the kids are kids living in poverty in this country, where most of the kids, most of their parents, whatever these studies say about anything, I will assure you that the people in that school district are working. They're working two and three jobs in many cases. And they're not lazy, they're not, and I know you're not saying that, they're not not working, that's not the problem. They're working at the jobs in the richest country in the world that pay them so little that no matter how hard they work, they cannot lift their kids out of poverty. And I will say, I'll turn it over to you, I will say a huge part of that is because this is not the 1990s in America anymore. A huge part of that is if you look, and I've got a slide we can talk about later, if you look at you know, the economic expansions from the 1930s until today, what you will see, and it's especially from the 1980s until today, what you will see is that people's incomes in America have flatlined for 50 years unless you are in the top 0.1, top one, top five, top 10, top 20 a little bit for the people in the bottom of the top 20. For everybody else, it has absolutely flatlined, especially for the people living in poverty. And that is a reason why I would argue that we, are, we face the stubborn problem that we face. It's not just this issue of government programs. In fact, I think much more important than that, it's that we have had an economy that where the people at the very top have benefited with every period of economic growth, and people in the rest of the economy, including not just poor people, but people in the middle class, have been flatlining, 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 so that for them, this is indisputable, for them, economic recoveries since the early 1980s have been recessions, not economic recoveries. And this may surprise you to hear this, but I agree with you. And you know how rare right now this exchange is in this kind of setting, and it shouldn't be. You, know, you were in, on a school board, okay? I was on the Partners Education Council in, in Oshkosh, and I sat with some of the most liberal college professors and the most conservative business people. The politics never came up because we were concerned about what we could do to improve the education of our children. The same thing here. There, is so, there are so many more things that unify us as a nation. I would argue right now that the greatest threat to this country is the division. And I tried to encourage Chairman Whitehouse yesterday to, you know, okay, Social Security is really important. In that hearing, we're just talking by each other. So let's have a round table. His reaction was, well, until you guys lay your plan on the table, there's no point. Well, and I think you know, we, we lay a plan on the table and it'll just be attacked. It's not, there are just some basic truths or basic realities that we need to let, get on the table, agree on the facts, and these hearings are not, they're just, they don't work that well. So I would encourage you as chairman of this subcommittee, let's, let's use this subcommittee as an example, let's set up a round table, let's bring in some experts to be as advisors, not necessarily provide testimony, but be as advisors as we discuss this over a series of, of meetings. And, and we, I think we will find far more areas of agreement and learn from each other. I just think it could, could maybe be a breakthrough in terms of how you can actually solve some of these problems. Again, I've done a lot of problem solving in the private sector. This place drives me nuts. No, it's just, again, we just don't approach this in a problem solving process where you agree you've got a problem, identify the root cause, 
you know, compromise is actually the last part of the process. And what, what just doesn't work is, you know, one side proposes, you know, offers a proposal, the other side, like, diametrically opposed, and it just never gets solved, as opposed to, let's focus on all the areas of agreement first, and then going through that problem-solving process, go, okay, now, now we start compromising on exactly how we ought to solve this problem, because, my, again, there's differences in opinion from the witnesses here, but my guess is all of you want to alleviate child poverty. Well, how's the best way to do it? And start, start discussing it. So again, I'm, what I'm proposing is a different process. And let's start at a subcommittee level. It doesn't seem like we would achieve it at the, at the front. I mean, you seem to be a person of goodwill. Let's start doing this. Great. Well, th thank you, Senator Johnson. I'll take that uh, okay. suggestion, and we, and we can think about how to make it work. I do think, you know, again, and I appreciate your, your agreement at the outset, I, which I w was not expecting. I do think that a lot of what we're struggling with, you mentioned the divisions in America. I think a lot of that has to do with the fact that we have had an economy, again, for 50 years that has not grown the way historically we've expected it to, you know, where when it grows, it grows for everybody. And, I, and it is my view, I don't know whether I'm right or whether I'm wrong, but it is my view that that's when you lose democracies in, in human history. You, you need a middle class. You exactly. Need a strong People middle class. People lose a no, sense it's, of it's, opportunity. It's not a good thing. They can't move their families ahead. And you mentioned, you know. By the way, I've, I've got a tax plan that would address that to a certain well, extent. We'd like to talk about that. But you, you, a, you a true Warren Buffett tax. You mentioned the, which is good because. You know, folks like Warren Buffett should not be paying I've got less in taxes than th his secretary. Uh, but the, but on education, you know, and I do, I want to get, I've got a couple questions I do want to ask these guys about priorities and spending. But, I'm, I'm assuming that these folks are finding this very interesting. Well, I don't know if they are. They're probably not because they're like my, you know, I, my mom and my dad are watching me and these knuckleheads on the committee won't shut up. So we will stop, but let me, let me just say on education though, because you raise it, and this is a place where I am just infuriated myself about Congress and about the federal government. You know, we have had yet another, in the last month, we have had two sets of reports about what's happening to America kid, American kids. Oh man, you have missed it. In the wake, in the wake. Now we'll return to regular order. In the wake, the adult supervision has returned. But in the wake of COVID, you know, and all of the educational loss that's happened, all of the, um, at least in my state, the mental health epidemic that's occurring among adolescents in, in America. And, and here we find ourselves once again posting horrendous, uh, uh, academic outcomes for kids. We, we, we're failing on the latest NAEP stuff. We're failing on the latest other assessments. And, you know, that's not a topic that ever comes up around here. Yeah. Like, what to well, do about it? Yeah, we, we don't, we don't I, want to discuss our failures. Well, we also, yeah. All right. Senator Thune, you're here at a Thank you very much, moment. Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Johnson. I appreciate the conversation. You're going to be able to put these folks back on TV with their moms and their dads so, and their families so they can I'm listen to their erudite.